Welcome to the 2021 Dibner Library Lecture. I'm Erin Rushing, the Outreach Librarian for Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. I'd like to begin this evening by gratefully acknowledging the Piscataway people on whose ancestral land I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here today. Our program tonight is titled, What Was James Smithson Doing in the Kitchen and Classroom? presented by Stephen Turner. And this is a very special program in honor of the Smithsonian's 175th anniversary celebrated this year. Stephen will be introduced by our head of special collections, Leela Beckerby. Leela? Good evening, everybody. Welcome at our 2021 Dibner Library Lecture. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Stephen Turner. Stephen Turner is a historian of science who for 32 years worked as curator of physical sciences at the National Museum of American History of the Smithsonian Institution. The broad range of his research interests include the history of physics, the history of chemistry, and with special emphasis, the uses of scientific instruments. For many years, he edited the science history journal Rittenhouse and created or contributed to numerous exhibitions, videos, and web projects. With several dozens of scholarly articles and more than 50 lectures, he enriched the scholarly record, not only in the above fields, but in the history of photography and the history of science education as well. In recent years, Turner became interested in the English chemist, James Smithson, the founder of the Smithsonian Institution. Because Smithson's scientific writings are famously difficult to follow, Turner made extensive use of his own replications of Smithson's experiments, many of them with the same tools and same natural materials that Smithson would have used. In addition to the in-depth historical research, these experiments generated surprising insights and as a splendid result, Turner's book, The Science of James Smithson, was published in the fall of 2020. The Wall Street Journal writes, and I quote, Although he published close to 30 articles in leading journals, Smithson's scientific efforts have often been viewed as mere dabbling, busy work with little impact. Not so, exclaims Stephen Turner. To rectify the record, Turner recreates down to the smallest detail the experiments Smithson had conducted and written about. Turner's book allows us to step for a few moments inside the world of a practicing enlightenment scientist to sit beside him as he fans the flames of a candle with his little blowpipe, waiting for that small mineral in front of him to melt and yield its secrets." End of quote. One of the surprises of Turner's study was the extent to which Smithson's scientific writings also offer clues about his personal interests and beliefs. Most of those clues are mentioned in Turner's book, but there wasn't always room to develop the non-scientific stories they had to tell. In this year's Dibner Library Lecture, Turner will present two of those stories. The first is a report on how Smithson's interest in cooking helped him to solve a scientific puzzle. The second is the unexpected account on Smithson's interest in scientific education, a lifelong interest that may have led to the founding of the Smithsonian. Stephen, 
Oh, Stephen, you are muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Would you like to turn your camera on? Uh, yes. Um, it's saying that the host has stopped it. Sorry about that, everyone. Very good. And Okay, I think we're ready to go. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for waiting, and and thank you, Leela. It was a it, for all those kind words. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. One of the perks of working at the Smithsonian was was having access to its world class libraries. And when I was a curator, I made good use of both the Dibner and Coleman rare book libraries. They're they're wonderful places to to work, and um, and the librarians are some of my favorite people in the world. Um, tonight, I'm happy to tell two stories that grew out of that research. The stories I want to tell you are about the English chemist James Smithson. Smithson, of course, is better known as the man who founded the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, parts of both stories can be found in my book, as Leela said, but tonight I'd like to tell them on their own and in a little more detail. These are two of my favorite Smithson stories, and I hope you enjoy them. The first story begins on a spring day in Paris in the year 1820. James Smithson has left England and is, and is living in Paris now, as he would for most of the rest of his life. He's 51, and on this particular morning, he's looking at one of the rocks in his mineral collection and thinking about a problem. He'd found the rock in Germany many years earlier, and when he cracked it open, he found something that greatly surprised him. It was a rare form of copper, one whose existence he was unable to explain. He'd been thinking about this off and on for many years now, and he must have wondered if he'd ever figure out how, how it had formed. But on this day, he suddenly did. A science historians used to like to talk about the eureka moment in science, the, the light bulb moment in science, when a sudden flash of insight, uh, the answer to some profound problem suddenly presents itself. But historians don't really like to think in those terms anymore, as most science doesn't really work that way. Except that in this case, it seems like it did. In the articles Smithson wrote about this, he tells us that he was thinking about the problem in the morning when the answer suddenly came to him. And after thinking about it a bit further, he performed a few experiments to demonstrate to himself that his explanation was correct. And that evening, he wrote a three-page article uh, describing his discovery, which he sent off to his publisher the next morning. So it's an entire scientific art article started and completed in a single day. Smithson doesn't tell us what triggered his sudden insight, but it's not hard to guess uh, what it was, because in, because in his article he explained that the unusual copper he'd found had been, quote, produced by a process entirely the same as that employed for the manufacture of macaroni and vermicelli. And I must admit that I got sidetracked by this statement when I was working on my book. I was intrigued by the connection between macaroni and mineralogy. It was so unusual and so unexpected that I had to look into it further. Unfortunately, Smith Smithson never explained what exactly it was about the manufacture of macaroni that so inspired him. So I had to first learn about early 19th century macaroni production, which was not without its challenges. In the end, this was the best description I could find, but I believe this is what Smithson was referring to. Um, this account was written about 1789, 30 years before Smithson's article, and I found it in one of the journals of none other than Thomas Jefferson, who later became the third president of the United States. This is Jefferson's description of a macaroni press that he bought during his time as ambassador to France. He brought it back with him when, when he returned to the States, and he later had it installed in the White House when he became a president. This is Jefferson's drawing of that instrument. And the first thing I should tell you about it is that it was large. Jefferson tells us that the machine was mounted on, quote, a strong wooden frame, which is shown here in brown. And he tells us that it was properly fastened to the wall, floor and ceiling of the room. Now, if the frame was attached to the floor and ceiling, that means it would have been around seven or eight feet tall. And as you can see, it took up a significant, a significant amount of floor space. This was a serious piece of equipment. 
And I should, I should, and I should also add that if you're assuming that this machine had a motor, it, it didn't. The way this press worked was by turning the large machine screw on the top. Uh, and Jefferson's drawing of that screw isn't the best, but I've identified it here in, in the arrow. And this screw was turned by inserting an iron bar into a hole in the bottom of the screw and then turning it by hand. As the screw turned, it pushed down on a heavy metal piston shown here by the red arrow. And the piston in turn pushed down on the round iron box below it shown here in blue. This, this box in blue is where the pasta was placed and the box on Jefferson's machine could hold between five and six pounds of raw pasta dough. So turning the large screw pushed down on the piston, which pushed down on the pasta in the pasta box. The dough was thick and sticky. Uh, Jefferson described it as, as very similar to, to bread dough. But as they kept turning the screw, the pressure in the box kept increasing until eventually it was strong enough to force the dough out through a series of small holes in the bottom of the box. It emerged as long strings of pasta in the shape of either macaroni or vermicelli, depending on the shape of the holes. And as they came out, these pasta strings were carefully gathered, cut to length and spread out to dry. This is the kind of machine that Smithson referred to in, in his article, but what was there about making pasta that helped him solve the riddle of the mysterious rock? What was the connection between macaroni and the strange form of copper that he'd found? It's time to go back and see exactly what he found in that rock. I apologize for this drawing, um, but retired curators don't get graphic support from the Smithsonian, so this is what you get. Um, this is my representation of the rock that Smithson was studying. Um, it didn't look special. Um, after all, it was just a piece of slag that he'd found in the waste pile of a foundry. But when he cracked it open, he found that it contained something truly amazing. Smithson found the rock contained a number of small round holes, which were likely the remains of bubbles that had formed when it was melted. And he, when he looked closer into the holes, he was surprised that, they, that uh, the holes, these former bubbles, were filled with thin copper fibers. They were much finer than human hair, and he described them as so delicately slender as to be a metallic wool. It's not hard to see why he was intrigued. This is a form of copper that for some reason was not known to occur in nature. So, that, so now that we know um, that the copper Smithson found was in the form of fibers, we can begin to see how the pasta press provided him a way to explain them. Smithson uh, clearly saw the pasta press as a model for how the copper fibers had formed, and he proposed that it had been pressure inside the rock that produced them, just like the pressure in the pasta press had produced macaroni. But where had the pressure in the rock come from? The answer is a little complicated and requires several, several special conditions. For one, Smithson's rock was made mostly from a mixture of the two metals, iron and copper, which have very different melting points. Iron melts at about 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas copper melts at just under 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that if you heat the rock to a point between those two numbers, then the copper and the rock will be melted, but the iron will not. It's a, a strange situation. Um, and of course, as the rock begins to cool, it will also begin to contract, so we're putting pressure on the material inside, including the molten copper. If the rock is solid and doesn't have any cracks or holes in it, then the copper won't have any, anywhere to go. The two metals will remain together and the rock will cool and harden back to the way it was before it was heated. But if there are any holes or cavities in the rock, then the pressure will force the molten copper towards these spaces, towards the bubbles in the rock. And this is possible because iron rocks are often filled with tiny holes called pores. And these pores give the copper a way of moving around inside the rock when it's under pressure. So when the pressure inside the rock gets high enough and the still molten copper is literally, literally squeezed through the tiny pores of the rock and into the empty holes, the copper is actually extruded into these, through these pores. And this accounts for how fine the fibers were that Smithson found. And if we could look on, inside the rock at the exact moment that this happens, we'd see copper fibers emerging into these bubbles from these tiny pores, just like vermicelli being squeezed from a pasta press. 
Smithson's explanation was indeed inspired, and it also appears to have been correct, although there were some twists and turns uh, before it was widely accepted. And one of the things I like about this story is that it gives us a glimpse into how Smithson's mind worked and how he went about solving a problem. I also like that it shows his scientific range. Smithson is always described as a chemist and a mineralogist, but as this article shows, he also contributed to other fields. The study of pressure belongs to physics, and, and so this study earned Smithson a small but meaningful mention in the history of that discipline. So thanks to Macaroni, Smithson became a pioneer in high pressure physics. So that's my story. That's my first story about Smithson science with a detour through the kitchen. And it's clear that he had a rich scientific life, but he must have also had a personal life. I mean, everyone does. And, and he must have had an interest in the events of the day and, and even political views. But very little about that part of his life has survived. There's still a lot about him that we just don't know. So as Leela said, one of the surprises of studying Smiths and science was discovering that he had a lifelong interest in science education. And that leads to my second story. What was James Smithson doing in the classroom? Now, it's not like he wanted to be a teacher, which he didn't. And he didn't want to run a school. Um, but he did seem to appreciate the importance of skilled workers. And towards the end of his life, he can, tried to contribute to worker education in several different ways. Now, I should tell you, as we start into this, that in Smithson's time, when people talked about worker education, they generally were talking about teaching working adults, not teaching children. In Smithson's time, most workers got no more than a basic education as they were growing up, after which they were generally denied access to further study. The worker education movement sought to address that problem by offering technical training classes for working adults. And I should mention that one of the characteristics of this worker movement was that women were always welcome to participate. But before I go any further, I need to put this story in context. Because Smithson lived in the time that we now call the Industrial Revolution. There was a time when more and more things that people used to do by hand were now being done by machines. The Industrial Revolution was all about machines powered by either water or steam, there didn't seem to be any end to what they could be made to do. But in the early days in Smithson's time, people began to see something that might hold back this progress. And it was a critical shortage of workers with the skills to keep these machines running. In the past, most skilled workers had gone through some kind of apprenticeship program, learning their trade faithfully by faithfully copying what their master did. This worked well enough for learning the traditional arts like blacksmithing or carriage making, where there are well-developed ways of doing everything. But what if it's the year 1780 and one of the complex new machines you just bought breaks down? You'll need someone to fix it, but, if you, but you may have trouble finding anyone with the necessary skills. Apprenticeships generally didn't try to teach workers to problem solve or troubleshoot. And there was really no way for the workers in Smithson's time to keep up with the changes in technology. A story was told around this time about a science professor who went to have some work done by a local machinist. And when he entered the shop, he happened to hear the machinist and his helpers talking about a new kind of pump they had to repair. And as they talked, the professor realized that none of them had any idea of how the pump actually worked. The need to have more skilled workers was widely acknowledged in Smithson's time. But the English efforts to address that need were often haphazard and complicated by politics and class. There was little or no public education back then. And even when the wealthy chose to school their workers, as they sometimes did, it was rarely in science or technology. In fact, many in the English upper classes, including the queen, benevolently, arg benevolently argued that if commoners were to be educated, it should first be a religious education as that's what would ultimately benefit them the most. So giving workers technical training was already a low priority in England, but it fell even further in 1789 with the onset of the French Revolution. 
As France descended into chaos, the English ruling classes grew increasingly fearful that a similar revolution might break out in England. And they took whatever steps they could think of to make sure it didn't. Now, a common belief among the English aristocracy during this time was that one cause of the French Revolution had been that French workers had gained too much power. The argument was that by empowering workers, uh, the French had upset the social order, that, that the workers no longer respected traditional institutions like the church and government. Uh, and that this uh, breakdown in society was what had helped trigger the revolution. True or not, the English Tory party embraced this narrative. And so the issue of worker education was suddenly politicized and it stayed that way for decades. Ultimately, this meant that during Smithson's time, there was essentially no government support for worker education in England. But as we fought, saw in the first story, if there's enough pressure, something unexpected may happen. And so the story of worker education in Smithson's time began not with some action by the crown or by parliament and not in London or even in England. The movement to educate workers in Smithson's time began, began in Scotland in the city of Glasgow. And it began when a science professor walked into the shop of a local machinist. That story, which I've already told, um, came from this man. He's John Anderson, the professor of natural history at the University of Glasgow. And that, that, that story about the workers took place in the 1770s. And, and shortly thereafter, Anderson began to offer evening science classes for working men. He developed his own curriculum, which was designed to teach them not only the principles of science, but also how to apply them. And since most of the workers were poorly educated, he, avoid, he avoided using math in these classes as, as you know, he used a lot of math in, in his regular university classes, but for the, the workers, um, uh, they just couldn't handle it. So instead he illustrated his lectures with demonstration machines that he designed and built himself. And, and some, of, some of these machines still exist. Oops, excuse me. Anderson's classes were either free or offered at very low cost and they soon became very popular. He was an engaging lecturer and the workers were highly motivated to learn. There was, also in, uh, there was also interest in Anderson's project within the broader academic and scientific communities and word of what, is, of what he was doing spread widely. In 1783, when a young James Smithson went across Scotland on his first scientific expedition, he and his companions made a point of stopping in Glasgow to visit Anderson. They spent an afternoon with him and Smithson got to see his science teaching instruments and to talk to him about the needs of workers. This was Smithson's first exposure to worker education, but it wouldn't be his last. Anderson continued to offer the, the evening classes for the rest of his life. And when he died, he left his estate to found a new institution, one de dedicated solely to worker education. In his will, he left detailed instructions about how it should be organized and governed and he directed that it should be called Anderson's Institution, although it was generally known as the Andersonian. The people of Glasgow embraced Anderson's new institution, and although his estate was not large enough to pay for it all, the citizens made more than made up the difference. The photo on the left taken in the late 19th century so shows the Andersonian's main building, and the image on the right shows its museum. The Andersonian survives today as the University of Strathclyde. The Andersonian was in many ways the first technical university and right from the start, it was a great success. It was popular with workers, giving many of them their first exposure to science and scientific thinking. And it was popular with the Glasgow businesses, which benefited from the stream of engineers and trained workers that the Andersonian soon began to produce. Initially, physics and chemistry were the core classes, but over the years, new classes and topics were continually, continuously added. Eventually, there was even a medical school. The success of the Andersonian inspired the creation of several similar institutions, the most important of them, at least to this story, being the Royal Institution in London. Founded in London in 1799, the Royal Institution was clearly modeled after the Andersonian. 
but for political reasons, it could not appear to be overly concerned with worker education. So it got around that difficulty by presenting itself as teaching science and technology to the general public, which of course included workers. And the Royal Institution even went so far as to recruit Thomas Garnett, the Andersonian's dynamic natural philosophy professor, who now became the Royal Institution's science teacher. And this is, this is a, one of my favorite photographs. I think this is really quite wonderful. Um, once he was settled in London, Garnett undoubtedly talked to the institution's members about what was going on at the Andersonian. And he may have even talked about it with a rising young chemist named James Smithson. Smithson had contributed a significant sum to the founding of the Royal Institution and as such was welcome to attend any of the lectures or programs. Smithson was also active on the chemistry committee during, that during the time that Garnett was there. Now Smithson would have been in his mid thirties at this time and worker education was something that the people around him were all talking about. It was an idea that was in the air as they say. And by, by being an active contributor to the Royal Institution, Smithson made it clear that it was an idea that he supported. Now establishing these large in urban institutions was an important step in the worker education movement, but these, but these resources were only accessible to the workers who lived close enough to attend them. The vast majority of English and Scottish workers received little benefits from these institutions. So in the early 19th century, the worker movement began to go in a different direction. And it seems to have started around 19, 1799, um, right at the end of the 18th century when the Andersonian hired George Birkbeck to teach natural philosophy. Brilliant and dedicated, Birkbeck ended up teaching several subjects, including a course he created on the mechanical arts. Held on Saturday evenings and initially free, the course proved to be extremely popular. It's reported that up to 500 students would attend these Saturday sessions, both men and women. When Birkbeck moved to London a few years later, the class continued to meet without him, and it appears that they continued to meet for many years. The students seem to have organized some kind of self-help club where more advanced students taught the less advanced. The details are unclear, but eventually this led to a new, more local and more assertive institution for worker education, what, was, what came to be called the Mechanics Institutes. The first Mechanics Institutes were in Scotland, in Glasgow and in Edinburgh, but they soon began to pop up elsewhere. As the name suggests, each institute was independent and run by local workers. Donations from wealthy citizens were welcomed and, and those, those donations were often needed to get these institutions started, but the workers remained in charge. The institute shown here, which was in Manchester was typical. Um, it had a library and a reading room. And in many of these institutions, the members could rent books for a small fee. The institutes also provided lectures and courses on useful topics, and some even had museums. Not unexpectedly, and quite logically actually, one of the attractions of the institutes was the opportunity they, they offered for social mobility. In class-bound England, there always seemed to be invisible barriers for those who wanted to move up. And for many English workers, the biggest obstacle to their advancement was being denied an education. The mechanics institutes were created to overcome that obstacle. And in so doing, they were empowering the workers. But in the early 1820s, when the mechanics institutes movement first got going, empowering workers was still a hot button topic. Even though the French Revolution and the Napole Napoleonic Wars were now history, um, and even though producing more engineers and skilled workers was in England's best interests, English conservatives were still fearful. And there was always the chance of a government crackdown if the workers got ahead of themselves and asked for too much. Fortunately, around this time, a new leader emerged within the movement. And it was our old friend, George Birkbeck from the Andersonian. After he left Glasgow, Birkbeck had moved to London where he was extremely active in worker education. 
For several years, he edited The Chemist, a technical journal for working men. And in that context, he may have met Smithson because he reviewed several of Smithson's articles in his journal. It also turns out that Birkbeck had been working behind the scenes with several of the me mechanics institutes, helping them find funding and helping to solve other problems. He was also busy raising money for his own project. And in 1823, he announced the founding of a large mechanics institute in London. Similar in size to the Royal Institution, the new institute would have a library, classrooms, teaching laboratories, and a lecture hall that could hold a thousand people. It promised to be a, no, a new social force in the nation's capital, and it put England on notice that its workers were intent on, on asserting their rights. One of Birkbeck's skills was to lead the worker movement without appearing to be a worker himself. Well-educated and articulate, he was able to move in social circles that were closed to other movement leaders. And he was able to offer assurances to the upper classes that the movement was not a threat. He was also a skilled communicator and under Birkbeck's leadership, one of the things that characterized the movement was its careful use of terminology. And of particular interest here is Birkbeck's insistence on talking about the diffusion of knowledge. For many decades, the phrase diffusion of knowledge had been used in a general sense to refer to public education and to the generalized benefits that it would bring. But within the movement, this phrase now took on political significance. In the Mechanics Institute movement, the lack of access to education took on the status of a class barrier. And so the diffusion of knowledge uh, came to refer to the, the removal of that barrier. And to give just one example, in the speeches made to the huge crowds that assembled for the opening of the London Institute in 1825, uh, there were re re repeated calls by, by not only Birkbeck, but by almost every other speaker at the event for the diffusion of knowledge. And the dedication carved into the Institute's foundation stone began, now we have founded an edifice for the diffusion and advancement of human knowledge. Much like the branding efforts that are so familiar in our own time, this phrase became identified with the movement. In some ways, the diffusion of knowledge became the Mechanics Institute's slogan. And for people of the time, any discussion of diffusion was a clear reference to these worker institutes. The point I want to make here is that by the spring of 1825, London had become the de facto center of the English worker education movement. And the impending opening of a London chapter of the Mechanics Institutes was seen by both sides as an important victory for the worker education movement. And it was into this environment at precisely this historical moment that Smithson now re-enters our story because it was right at this time in the spring of 1825 that he, re that he returned to London to put, his fair to put his affairs in order and to write his will. Smithson hadn't been in London for many years, but as he refamiliarized himself with the city, it would have been hard for him to miss what was happening. There was a lively debate in the newspapers about how worker education should be funded, organized, and controlled. And the large crowds that attended worker education events throughout the city were hard to miss. And then there's Lord Holland, one of Smithson's oldest and best friends, and one of the wealthiest men in England. Holland lived in London and was a Whig leader from an old family of Whig leaders. And he was a longtime supporter of worker education. He would have been well informed about the movement's status and would have, would have conveyed that information to Smithson when they met. So it seems almost impossible that Smithson wouldn't have known about this story and been interested in it. But is there any actual evidence that he was? And this is where the story gets interesting because there is. On May 12th, 1825, shortly after having arrived back in London, Smithson wrote his last significant article. It was about the small chemical balance that he had carried on his travels and used in his experiments. That's a drawing of it at the bottom of the page. The balance was small, lightweight, inexpensive, easy to make, and it was surprisingly accurate. Smithson had been using it for almost 35 years and it had served him well. 
Had he written about it earlier, it might have been useful to other scientists, but for whatever reason, he had never gotten around to doing that. But now, after all that time, he suddenly decided to describe it. Because while his balance may not have been of scientific interest anymore, Smithson realized that it was perfect for workers to use. And this was clearly the audience that his article reached. Smithson's article was published in a respected science journal, uh, one that happened to be edited by one of his friends, um, but no other so science journal either in England or in Europe saw fit to, to mention Smithson's article. The four journals that did review Smithson's article were, as you can see here, all dedicated to worker education. They all reviewed it favorably and Smithson's balance soon became the recommended scale for be beginning chemistry students. And these are just some of the introductory chemistry textbooks that recommended using Smithson's balance to their students. The first two went to multiple editions and were translated into both French and German. What I'm trying to show here is that almost as soon as he arrived in London and saw what was going on, Smithson sat down and wrote an important article specifically intended to support worker education. I really don't see that there's any other way to interpret this. And if we accept this point, it follows that Smithson must have also been thinking about worker education when a few months later, he began another writing project, which was his will. Smithson's will has always been something of a puzzle because most of it consisted of ordinary instructions for the disposal of his state. And only at the end, in the unlikely event that his heirs died without producing children, that he, did he direct that his fortune should go to the United States of America to found at Washington under the name of the Smithsonian Institution, an establishment for the increase and diffusion of knowledge of men. This single sentence was the full extent of Smithson's instructions about what to do with his, his estate. And its, and its exact meaning has been a topic of considerable discussion over the years. Um, in the time I have left, I'd like to explore what, we, what you can say about it now now that Smithson's interest in worker education is on the table. To begin with, it seems clear that Smithson's phrase, diffusion of knowledge is a reference to the Mechanics Institute movement. And his use of increase is a clear reference to the increase of scientific knowledge, which is what he had dedicated his life to doing. Smithson's decision to use the name Smithsonian Institution is in line with the naming traditions of the time, wealthy men often created institutions named after them. But his use of the Smithsonian um, also carries connotations of the Andersonian up in Glasgow where the worker movement began. So it seems that Smithson was thinking about something big, an institution dedicated to the twin goals of the increase of knowledge and the diffusion of that knowledge back to the people. He could have just left his estate to some existing institute or cause in England or on the continent. Um, it would have been much easier for, for him to do and, and the results of, of the donation would have been much more certain, but that's not what Smithson chose to do. But why did he choose to do it in the United States? Why did he send his fortune to a place he had never even visited? But if you think about it, really, what other choice did he have? England wouldn't have honored the kind of request that Smithson made in his will. And it's hard to imagine any European government uh, which would have either. Moreover, Smithson didn't have any institutional or religious affili affiliations that he, he could count on to administer as his estate. At the time he wrote his will, he was old and frail. And if he wanted to do something new, something big, he was savvy enough to know that the United States was really his only option. And so Smithson chose to take a chance. He sent, his for, he sent his fortune off to America along with his cryptic instructions. And against all odds, it flourished and grew into the institution that we see today. It was the American people that made it great, but we honor Smithson for taking the chance that made it possible. So those are my stories, or at least as much of them as I uncovered. And now I'll turn back things over to Aaron and I'll be happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Steve. I um, personally had never heard of the Andersonian or the Mechanics Institute. So it's um, fascinating context for the history of our institutions. Really fascinating. I also personally enjoy hearing about Smithson as a pasta lover. Um, it makes him seem like a real human being. Um, earlier or last week, you shared on our blog your experience um, recreating Smithson's coffee experiment. And uh, I, I love to think of Smithson as a fellow pasta lover and coffee lover. It, it really humanizes this mythic person. Um, so I know that we have some questions already from the audience in our q and I'll encourage everybody else to go ahead and pop their questions in there if they have them. And I think that Leela also had some questions that she would like to ask. Okay. Yes, I do. Oh. And uh, I would like to start with uh, something that refers more to the rest of your book. And that is the numerous experiments that Smithson made and created, and then you recreated <clears throat> in your work uh, during your research. So I just got interested in where were scientific experiments carried out in Smithson's time? That, that, that's an excellent question. And, and, and there's really, I mean, the short answer is they were carried out everywhere. Um, there really weren't laboratories in Smithson's time. I mean, plum, what we consider indoor plumbing was just, just being introduced at that time. Um, uh, but but um, uh, most, most of the kind of experiments Smithson did were either done on his kitchen table or if he was traveling, they were done back in his, his uh, hotel room. Um, and to, to make that possible, Smithson and, and, and other chemists, I'm, I mostly know about chemistry on this, um, uh, they used miniature tools, um, miniature furnaces and such. And, and Smithson was, was uh, a leading innovator in miniaturizing his tools. Uh, microchemistry, was, he, was, uh, he was one of the pioneers of it. And uh, I've, I've confirmed this from, from the, the toolkit of his that I, I reproduced that that he could have actually carried everything he needed to do his experiments in the pockets of his coat. And, and there's actually re reports of him doing that, of being at a party, and, and there's a famous story about, about him analyzing a woman's tear and, and demonstrating that it contained a few molecules of chlorine in it. Um, so so I, 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 the best way to think about science in Smithson's time was that it was, it was less of a profession and more of a lifestyle. Uh, science was something that you were, not so much something that you did. And, and it's also worth mentioning in this context that Smithson never made a dime off of any of his scientific research, um, but he didn't. That, that was neither here nor there. So that, that's, that's my brief answer to your question. Thank you, thank you. And I think I will um, will give the, the opportunity to the audience now, and maybe if there is time, I have another question. Great. Okay, thank you, Leela. Um, yeah, we do have a, a, some great questions in the Q&A. Um, in particular, uh, where did you find your account of Smithson's views on education? Ah, um, well, this, this is, at, 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 for, forgive me, I haven't been on Zoom for a long time, so I heard you're in trouble talking. Um, the, the story about worker education just kind of fell out of the research I was doing on Smiths and Science. I, I kept running into the, the same people, you know, like Birkbeck or, or, or Garnett or, and, you know, the, the, they were up in Glasgow, they were down in, in London, and, and Smithson knew all these people. And, and, and so it just being a good historian and following up on these leads, um, the, the, the story kind of wrote itself. It, it, was, it was really quite wonderful. And, and I'm, I'm convinced that there's, there's more to be found yet. So, so my retirement uh, uh, research isn't over quite yet. Uh, the next question I think refers to Smithson's note in his will. Um, was Smithson's instruction meant to be applied to just males or was he, his use of men applied to all workers, male and female? Um, def definitely the, the worker men 
movement was was um, um, not gender exclusive. Um, women were were. Um, it's it's actually one of the characteristics of the worker movement that women were always in, eligible to participate in any of, of the events. Um, um, and th that's one of the things that gave it so much power is, is uh, that, that it was serving such a large group of the population. Thank you. Um, is there an example of Smithson's balance in the Smithsonian Institution collections? If so, where did that one come from? Well, um, there, there's no, the, the short answer is no. Um, I do, maybe I should donate my, uh, my, my reproduction of Smithson's balance uh, there. Um, no, I, I, I looked everywhere I could think of uh, to find a, uh, one of Smithson's balance and, and I, I wasn't able to find any that survived, but, but it's such a delicate little instrument. Um, it's easy to make, it's easy to use, it's very accurate, but it's extremely delicate. Um, you know, if you look too hard at it, it'll almost break. So, so it's not surprising that these things haven't survived. Um, but but um, you're, I, I really should dedicate that to the Smithsonian. Maybe I'll put together a Smithson toolkit and, and donate it. So thanks for that suggestion. Um, is there evidence the Smithson knew or met Americans in Paris or England or elsewhere? Um, yes, yes, he, he knew several Americans and he, he uh, corresponded with several Americans. And, and um, uh, I, I think, I think some Americans sent him material. There was something in Smithson's notes about an American had sent, later in his life, an American had sent him a sample of rattlesnake venom that he was trying to analyze. Um, and I also remember, um, I think when he was in his early 30s, he was corresponding with a woman in America who was having some difficulties. And he wrote to one of his friends to, uh, uh, to give her legal assistance in America. So, so his, his connections were, with America were, were surprisingly strong, even though he never crossed the ocean, never visited. Um, and, and there were a lot of Americans that were pretty aware of what Smithson was doing, um, and particularly of his um, worker education stuff. So another, another thing for me to research. Um, we have a question about Smithson's will, um, which was why would no European nation at the time have followed Smithson's will? And I, I think that's, well, I'll let you take a stab well, at that. Well, well that, that's, I mean, I, I guess technically that's my speculation. I, I, I'm not sure I could really prove that, but I mean, why would any European nation take the, you know, try, try, to, try to serve a, a uh, and an English scientist who was kind of uh, estranged from England. Um, Smithson was in this, this, this curious position towards the end of his life of not really being associated with anything. He was estranged from England. He, he wasn't a member of any of the, the French scientific societies. He, he, he knew everyone, he talked to everyone, but he, he didn't have the affiliations that would have allowed him to, to start a, a new project so late in his life. And that actually is a good segue into um, another question, which is why didn't Smithson get an academic position? There were scientists practicing at the time, correct? Um, do, 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 you, do you mean oh, an academic position in a university or something? Um, I assume that's what that means. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Smithson never taught and never had any, any interest in teaching. I don't, I don't think he ever actually gave a lecture even. Uh, there's, there's just no re record of it. Um, but on the other hand, he didn't need to. I mean, he was independently wealthy um, and, and his, he self-funded all his research. I mean, he didn't really need anything. And I think, I think he felt that, that having a job would just get in the way. Uh, uh, he, he was extremely productive and hardworking. And, uh, um, so, so that was just not something that an aristocratic English chemist would do. Do you have any thoughts on the possible influence of Alexander von Humboldt on Smithson? Well, that's interesting. Yeah, they, they knew each other. Um, uh, yeah, they they met in Paris, I think, when around 1814 or a little after that, when when, when Smithson moved back there. And, and there's a report of 
I forget the name of the society. There's a French society and, and there's a report of Smithson and a, a bunch of other famous European chemists all sitting around chatting. And, and one of the uh, reports on, on, on this meeting was that the Humboldt was, was talking incessantly, but he was so interesting that, that everyone just let him do it. Uh, but yes, they, they knew each other and, and, and clearly interacted. That's great. Um, another question is, there is a mechanics institute in San Francisco with a library. Mm -hmm. Was there a direct carryover from the English mechanics institute? Um, very, very much so. And, and um, uh, the, the English were, were very active in expanding the mechanics institutes. If, um, uh, and and I, think, I think the San Francisco Institute um, made a big deal out of the diffusion of knowledge uh, phrase too. Um, but but yeah, there there was there were in shortly after the Smith around the time the Smithson was the Smithsonian was founded. I think there was a mechanics institute in New Orleans. There was one in, in San Francisco, and I think there was a couple up in New England too. Um, so, Which yeah. is a, another good segue into our next question: How literate were the attendees of the institutes generally? <laughs> well, of course, we don't know you know know for sure about this, but but. Um, Everything I've read and, and, and um, is that the, they probably, I'm, I'm sure they could, they could read, um, probably had, had really rudimentary mathematical skills and that was probably about it. Um, uh, it, it was, you know, this is, this is a, a, pre, um, a pre-industrial education system trying to be applied to the early industrial age uh, and it just didn't fit. Um, another question is how long did communications from England to America usually take during Smithson's time without telecommunications? Um, well, it's as, as fast as a, a sailing ship could get across the ocean, I'm, uh, I'm sure they were all sail ships. Um, so, so weeks, at least weeks. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it's amazing. It's amazing how much they were able to do with such a a slow communication system, but anyway. Um, okay, let's see. We have many, many more questions to choose from. Um, so I apologize in advance to our audience if we, do, if we don't get to your questions specifically, but this has been um, a really insightful conversation that I think has gotten a lot of people thinking about um, our institutional history and our founding donors. Right. Um, but um, one question, another question is, um, given his status as the, the son of the Duke of Northumberland, would Smithson's lack of um, aristocratic standing affect his standing in the country and his decision? Um, and also, did he not have connections with American scientists? Um, I, I think he did have some connections with American scientists. Um, uh, I believe there was a, a gentleman somewhere in the South that was, was corresponding with Smithson. Um, but, but um, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I lost my, my train of thought. Can you give me the first part of that? Uh, um, sorry. There, I'm, everyone, our audience has been very participatory. We've had some, a lot of great questions tonight. Um, given his status as the son of the Duke of Northumberland, oh. would his lack of aristocratic standing right, 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 affect? Right. Okay. Um, 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 well, of course, he was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Northumberland, and, and the Duke never acknowledged Smithson. So there was no formal connection there. Um, one of the things I discovered in writing the book was that, that Smithson and his, his natural father, the Duke, um, were in touch. They, um, I believe they were in the, in the same chemistry class. There was a private chemistry school in Soho, London. And I believe that Smithson and his father um, were attending a class together. Um, in one of the footnotes of one of his articles, he talks about how uh, his, the bond between him and his father was basically uh, studying chemistry. And so this, it's kind of a, 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 um, an interesting way to, to see how Smithson developed his attachment to, to, to chemistry, you know, that it wasn't just an, in, an, in, an intellectual endeavor, but that uh, there's emotions involved in all this. So, um, Regarding Smithson being discriminated against because he was illegitimate, I haven't really found any evidence of that. In the scientific circles that he traveled, 
there were so many people that had so many odd quirks and idiosyncrasies that, that being illegitimate was not really an issue. They were all just, just doing science and not worrying about that kind of stuff. So, so I think Smithson went through life pretty much you know, undamaged by, by being illegitimate uh, as the wealthy often can avoid things like that. Good to know. Um, did Smithson know about Benjamin Franklin's uh, benefactions to Boston and Philadelphia for the support of men starting small businesses after their apprenticeships? That's a good question. And I, I do not know. Um, I, I haven't run across any connections between Smithson and Franklin. I mean, they were the kind of at different time periods. Um, but I, I, I really can't address that without a little bit more thought. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, I think we'll we'll answer one last question. And again, I do apologize if we haven't gotten to your question. It's been a, it's been a very busy uh, interactive <laughs> night. Um, I've always heard that Smithson's bequest included a small mineral collection lost in the Great Fire of 1865. If true, is there any evidence that it included the rock, the piece of slag from your first story? Ah. Uh, um... Well, I mean, you know, that the, 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 the Smithsonian fire of 1846, I believe, um, when, when Smithson's mineral collection was destroyed, it was just, it was just a disaster, uh, of, you know, for, for anyone that had any sort of interest in Smithson. But it, it was also a disaster for American science because Smithson's mineral collection was the best one in this country. Um, uh, yeah, um, so I... I would suspect that that um, the Smithson sample was was destroyed in that fire, um, but but the, the the records just aren't aren't there to to say one way or the other. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been wonderful. I really do well, appreciate you. this this look. Um, as a quick reminder to our attendees, please do take a moment to um, complete our event survey um, on your way out, and we will try to maybe. Um, answer a few of these leftover questions in our follow-up email. I also wanna invite you to join us on December 16th for our next Smithsonian Film Fest. I'll pop a link to that in the chat now. And I've linked it a few times in the chat, but you can grab Steve's book um, from Smithsonian Books from smithsonianstore.com. So if you're looking for a Christmas present for the science lover in your life, please consider that. So thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Farewell. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Leela.